Hello, I'm Rachel Deer, host of today's program, COVID-19 Critical Care, What Providers Need to Know. This is the May 22nd update of DKB Med Radio's Coronavirus Educational Series, COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. Thank you for joining us. As a reminder, we are now providing twice weekly 15-minute webcasts and podcasts featuring the latest news, treatment updates, and clinical considerations, as well as answering your questions about COVID-19. These will be available on Wednesday evening and Friday morning. Sign up at covid19.dkbmed.com to be sure you get the latest updates. Today's program is accredited for ANCC and AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website for complete CME and CE information. To attest for CME and CE credit, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. There you will find all of our previous COVID-19 programs and have access to other free CME and CE programs on a wide range of topics. Slides from today's presentation, as well as previous presentations, can be found in the Resource Center. Today's learning objectives are state three effective methods for reprocessing and decontaminating N95 respirators, list two N95 performance measures that may be affected by decontamination methods, and describe the proper doffing method for N95 respirator. Again, I'm very happy to introduce Sue Hansen, a clinical nurse specialist at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. This is the second part of Sue's series on PPE in the hospital setting amidst the pandemic. Sue, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'd also like to thank the generous support of DKB Med, Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, and the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. So today we're going to talk about reprocessing N95 respirators, doffing, donning, and reuse methods for N95s. This is a statement that the CDC put out regarding reprocessing N95s, and it states, while well, disposable filtering face piece respirators, FFRs, like N95s, are not approved for routine decontamination as conventional standards of care, FFR decontamination and reuse may be needed during times of shortage to ensure continued availability. The reason why I wanted to include this statement is because as a nurse, and I think I can speak for many of us, I don't think there's ever been a time when we have had to encounter any sort of extended use or reuse of N95 respirators. And this has made a huge impact on our care, our care delivery, our workflow, as well as our ability to feel safe in our own work environment. And I think that the extended use and reuse is going to become more the standard of practice versus the traditional conventional use uh, of our N95 respirators. It has just made a huge impact on our practice. So what is effective decontamination? Decontamination serves to reduce the pathogen burden, maintain the function of the filtering face piece, and leave no residual chemical hazards behind. So what works? This was a study that came out just about a month ago that the NIH had validated. And what they looked at is they analyzed four different decontamination methods. They looked at UV um, germicidal radiation, dry heat up to 70 degrees Celsius, 70% ethanol, and um, vaporized hydrogen peroxide. And they compared this to steel. And they evaluated the inactivation rate, the filtration performance, uh, the mask integrity as it relates to the number of decontaminations. And then afterwards, they assessed fit and filter uh, capabilities of that individual mask. When we look at ethanol, ethanol seems to uh, decontaminate the mask very quickly, but it did not maintain its integrity and its performance after one uh, decontamination session. So when looking at dry heat, it tended to take a little bit longer to decontaminate the mask. And they also found that some residual uh, microorganisms were left on the metal pieces of the mask, say the nose bridge, the area where you have to form around your nose. Um, but the integrity of the mask was maintained up to two cycles of reprocessing. Uh, the next was looking at UV germicidal radiation. This too took quite a bit of time 
to decontaminate the mask, but after three cycles of uh, decontamination with the UV method, the mask did maintain its fit and its performance. And lastly, they looked at vaporized hydrogen peroxide. This was another method that worked very, very well. And after three cycles, the mask maintained its filter performance and its fit. Overall, I think between all four types of reprocessing methods, the vaporized hydrogen peroxide method was the one that seemed to perform the best. So what did the CDC uh, recommend regarding reprocessing methods? Um, and they don't recommend either. They don't officially endorse any method, but during times of crisis, conservation strategies should be implemented. The three methods that they state show promise are UV irradiation, vaporized hydrogen peroxide, and they even included warm, moist heat as one of the methods that can be uh, used for reprocessing. One of the things they do recommend are mitigation strategies for when we do have times or periods where PPE is very limited. During conventional times, which is not now, that's uh, during the time where all N95 masks can be a one-time use. But during contingent times or contingent periods of time where N95 materials are in short supply, uh, institutions can implement extended use of N95s, and this is repeated close contact encounters with several patients of the same pathogen for up to eight continuous hours. This should have uh, little to no impact on the function of the N95 respirator. It does increase uh, risk of contact transmission, though, and that is why when we doff those masks or take those masks off, we need to be very mindful in our methods of doffing so as to not contaminate ourselves. And then during times of crisis, and this is when we really do not have enough of those N95s around, which our institution has experienced this as well as I'm sure many other institutions. Reuse is when you doff after each encounter and you store that mask for another use later. Limited reuse can be used up to five times. There is a risk of contact transmission to the staff member who's wearing it. So again, you need to be mindful in your doffing methods when removing uh, the mask and, and storing it for later use. So when you look at the side, you may think, wow, this is busy. How am I gonna follow this? And you are correct, it is very, very busy. And the reason it's busy is because when you doff your PPE equipment, you have to be very methodical when removing it so as to not contaminate the mask you're gonna reuse and contaminate yourself. Ideally, you should be having a trained observer or someone outside watching you doff and take off this equipment so as you do not contaminate yourself. I know some institutions do not have that. We were fortunate enough to be able to have the staff to have that trained observer watch us take off our PPE in order to not contaminate ourselves. So in order to shorten things up, our participant here had already doffed his gown and gloves inside the patient's room, performed hand hygiene, came out and uh, re-put on a new pair of clean gloves prior to taking off the eyewear and the mask. Under conventional circumstances, you would be doing this over a garbage bin. You would remove your eyewear, toss them in the garbage, perform hand hygiene over those same existing pair of gloves before you start taking off your mask. When removing your N95 mask, you need to remove the bottom strap first, pull those straps taut, and pull it over your head so it dangles right in front of your face over the garbage bin. At the time, you should be performing hand hygiene again before you touch those top upper straps because remember those top upper straps or those straps both are considered uh, dirty. When you remove the top upper strap, ideally, again, under conventional circumstances, you would just toss that into the garbage bin, remove your gloves, and perform hand hygiene. But in the case of having to reuse, you will need to store that mask, and I'll show you how to store that, and there's several methods you can do that. You'll need to store that mask before removing your gloves. Once you remove your gloves after you doff the mask for the final time, then uh, you will, of course, perform hand hygiene again. So based on the method of your reprocessing for N95, you'll have to label your masks in different ways. 
Um, if you're using the vaporized hydrogen peroxide method, I know our institution just started using this method. We did use the UV method um, in the past. And so right now we are using uh, the vaporized hydrogen peroxide method by Battelle. And with this method, you need to label your mass with your institution's code. This is given to you um, by the company. The mass are reprocessed hundreds to thousands at a time. You will not get your individual mass back, but it will come back to your institution. If you're using the UV form of reprocessing, you'll need to label it with your name, the unit that you work on. In addition, once it's reprocessed, a hash mark will be put on the one of the straps to indicate how many times it has been reprocessed. Some studies show that the Battelle method, you can reprocess that mask up to 20 times, but with UV radiation or irradiation, it should only be reprocessed up to three times, and that's why we put hash marks on those masks. So how do you store this? Nurses were very creative in coming up with ways to properly store the mask. Whatever way you choose to store it, you need to maintain the integrity of the N95 mask and the actual fit of the mask so you can reuse it again, as well as you need to protect it from surface contamination. Now remember, you know, reusing an N95 is um, not a new practice. We've done that all the time in terms of crisis with other uh, different types of pathogens like tuberculosis. That is nothing new, but because with COVID-19, it is also transmitted with contact surfaces, and we need to make sure that we don't recontaminate that mask by how we store it. So you can use a lunch container, you can use a to-go box. Here we also have a container for a water pitcher, and if you use a paper bag method, you can use a straw to support the straps. The goal is to not let the straps come into contact with um, the inside of the mask, the outside of the mask, and you do not want to put it away in such a way that it destroys the form or the function of the mask either. But again, nurses have, there's other ways of storing it. I'm very impressed with how creative they've been in order to find ways to uh, store all these masks. Retrieving your mask, that's another, that's another story in itself. It can be kind of complicated, and this is where your trained observer comes into play watching you retrieve that mask and don it appropriately. Again, you need to perform hand hygiene and put on your gown and gloves in the proper fashion. When you retrieve your mask, you wanna do so as to not grab it by the straps. You wanna pinch it on the sides. And when you're putting it back on, you also don't wanna to touch the outside of the mask. You're gonna don your mask with the bottom strap first as always, and then the top strap and then you're going to hand hygiene because those straps were dirty. Remember, they were on your head before. Then you're gonna to wanna to perform a fit test. And when you perform a fit test, we'll go over it in the next slide. But when you perform a fit test, the goal of that is to ensure that, again, it fits appropriately. There are no leaks and there is nothing that would increase the risk to you by wearing that mask again. Once you perform that fit test, you're going to want to remove your gloves, perform hand hygiene again, and put on your shield. If you don't have a shield, then you can put on goggles. And we here at Harborview recommend if you're only using goggles, go ahead and use a simple mask over the reprocessed N95 as well. So before you use that mask again, after you have donned it, you'll need to perform a fit test. And what does the fit test entail? It's basically you need to ensure again that the straps are still maintain their elasticity and they fit over the crown of your head and the nape of your neck well, that the bridge of your nose, that steel portion fits tightly around your nose, that the sides of the mask and the very bottom of the mask where it can gape a little bit fits tightly around your face, that there are no leaks. I always tell people, especially if they wear glasses, you know, to exhale really hard. Those glasses that you're wearing should not fog up and you should feel no air moving outside the mask. Again, just to recap, I guess I wanted to hit home that reprocessing of masks, even though the CDC states under the contingent circumstances, it should have very little impact on form and function. It does have a great impact on staff nurses and other staff as well. This is not what we are used to. I believe that we have gotten used to reprocessing and reusing masks, but this has made a huge impact on how safe we feel in our work environment. And I think going forward that we need to come at it with the mindset that it's here to stay 
that reuse and reprocessing masks are not going to go away and that it is very safe. We have been using the extended method of uh, wearing N95s for quite a long time with other respiratory illnesses and that it has shown to be safe. We are not increasing our risk any more than by using them one time and that these new methods of reprocessing, specifically the Battel, it has been around for a couple of years, but I'm assuming in this day and age, we're gonna find more and more companies uh, reprocessing masks that they will uh, show to be very safe and effective for all of our patients and our staff to reuse. And so that is all I have. Um, I will be happy to take questions um, if you have any questions. Thank you, Sue. For our learners, these are the references for some of the information Sue provided us with today. And these slides will also be available in the Resource Center. We'll now continue to the listener Q&A to submit questions for Sue about next week's topic, Camp COVID, what we have learned so far. Please send questions to qa at dkbmed.com. If we are not able to address your questions in this session, we will try to address it in another session. Sue, first question. I manage staff who work in school clinics. When we do get back to school, what do you recommend for clinic staff to use for PPE? That's a really good question. I think some of it depends uh, on your state regarding universal masking. I know in the state of Washington, everyone masks wherever we go that quite possibly will extend into the workplace for other areas besides hospitals. But in that instance, all of your staff members should be wearing masks while you're working. If you should have a child come into the clinic that's exhibiting respiratory type symptoms, um, you will of course want to put a mask on them and ensure that you have a mask yourself. You'll always uh, wanna be wearing gloves when caring for that student, as well as uh, in between students, you'll want to wipe down all contact surfaces. So all chairs, if you have uh, like couches that they lay on, um, any type of equipment that you use for them, you'll want to wipe all those down as well. In addition, if your uh, school district can have disposable materials regarding stethoscopes, thermometers, things like that, that's always um, preferential over those multi-use items. Lastly, I think that if a child is sick and they uh, do have or they are positive for some respiratory type virus like COVID-19, it would be great if the school system had a process in place before the school year started regarding notification of the school and other families. You know, those kids go out and they play on the playground several times a day. The classrooms are generally overcrowded with students. They have 25 to 30 students in each classroom. And so there provides an environment for cross-contamination and that those other families and students, as well as other employees of the school district will need to be notified uh, promptly. Also, uh, it'd be good to have a process in place for when those kids can return to school. And Sue, our last question, what are some common errors made when donning or doffing? Oh, well, there's many. Consistently though, with donning is taking things that are not needed into the isolation room. When you're going into an isolation room, the only thing you should be wearing is scrubs. You should not be wearing scrubs with the t-shirt underneath. You should have the bottoms of your scrub pants tucked into your socks. Uh, we do that all the time. You should not be taking in stethoscopes, pens, pencils, beepers, pagers, uh, cell phones, ID badges. All those materials should be left outside. If you take it inside the room and you bring it out and then you wear it throughout the hospital, that's where you will be um, contaminating other areas and potentially other staff uh, within the hospital. So just remember the only thing you go into an isolation room with is your PPE and your scrubs and nothing else. Regarding doffing, probably the most consistent things we see as a mistake is people are going too fast or they don't have a trained observer and they're not following the steps. The reason it's so tedious and it has so many steps is because those steps are there to protect you and the steps should be in sequential order so as to not contaminate yourself. So please, please, please read those steps if you have to. I tell folks read them one at a time to ensure that nothing is missed and you're going in the appropriate order. Um, that way it may take a few minutes longer, but you know that you can leave that room, you can leave that unit, you can go home and uh, 
your chances of contaminating yourself will be very, very small if you follow those meticulous steps. Thank you again, Sue, for your contribution to the program. As a reminder, to claim CME or CE credit, please complete the evaluation at covid19.dkbmed.com and select today's activity. You will receive your certificate immediately after. Any questions or issues, feel free to email us at the address listed. Don't forget to access our resource center at covid19.dkbmed.com. There you'll find information on the latest COVID-19 data and statistics, medical society guidelines, and resources in Spanish. Please be on the lookout for our next activity on Wednesday, May 27th, featuring Dr. Paul Alwater from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. We will send out an email when it becomes available. Any questions can be submitted by sending to qa at dkbmed.com. Again, thanks for joining us and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19. Thank you again so much, Sue, for contribution to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you.